All right, so this is the introduction to biology notes. Um, you should be watching this probably week one, right? So uh, as far as intro to biology are concerned, basically uh, biology is the study of life, okay? And that's what we're going to be looking at here. We're going to be looking at relationships. We're going to be looking at, um, you know, the interplay between living things, how living things are organized, you know, from the cellular level all the way up to ecosystems, all right? Uh, but before we get into that, let's kind of look at how I set up my notes. Okay, so uh, in my biology class, every set of notes, with few exceptions, start with what we call the central questions. You want to be able to answer those questions before you take a test. All right, so um, we'll see them on the next slide. What is the importance of an experiment? Well, how does an experiment, you know, used in science? What does biology study at most importantly, excuse me, what are the characteristics of living things? So these four uh, bullet points are the things that you should be able to answer when you come out of this uh, set of notes. Now, key terms, vocab words, they're going to show up in blue, right? They're important. Make sure you, you recognize, hey, there's a blue word. I didn't know that word. If you see something in red, that means it's essential. You need to know that thing. You should write it down in your notebook for sure. Right. Key terms, definitely write those down. Text in red, write that down. Stuff in just normal black text, all right, is um, stuff that we're going to go over. Okay. It's additional facts. It's, uh, you know, examples, that kind of thing. Now, notice this is in red. Good note taking does not mean you copy everything. Okay. I've color coded these things for a reason. All right. Focus on the color coded words and information. All right. Now, will the black information be important? Yeah, absolutely. But do you need to write it down word for word? Absolutely not. All right. We are working in a virtual environment. Um, so, you know, you can absolutely print slides off and make notes with them. So uh, if you go to file and you hit print and right here where it says full page slides, if you go to three slides, you can print out the slides with these wonderful um spaces to take notes next to it. That way you don't need to write anything uh, in your notebook. You could actually just punch holes in this, keep it in your spiral, stay put together. You have the whole PowerPoint and the notes together. So uh, that is one option. If you need it bigger, uh, there is a notes page, which will print one slide per page and leave a blank spot at the bottom. Um, but that is entirely up to you. Okay. I don't grade your notes um, until it's time to take a test, right? That's when your notes count. So let's look at our central questions. Um, we want to know what an experiment is, which you've probably already heard about. We want to know how it uh, is important to ex in science specifically. We already talked about what biology studied, right? We said that biology is the study of life. So the prefix bio means life uh, and the ology ending means the study of. So that's a pretty easy one. We should already be able to uh, answer. I finally want to look at the characteristics of living things, okay? So uh, scientific investigation, why is it important? Well, we use these words research, investigation, experimentation, interchangeable, okay? Um, if someone says, well, I'm, I'm researching, uh, you know, Buckminster Fullerene, which is a, a molecule that looks like this, okay? This is carbon atoms. Um, if someone says, hey, I'm researching this Buckminster Fullerene, that would be exactly like if they said, I'm investigating Buck Minister Fullery. They call it Bucky Ball. Um, or I'm doing experiments with Bucky Ball. All those things are the same. Doing a scientific experimentation uh, with a set method, right? The scientific method um, allows us to get good data, right? That uh, scientists can compare with one another. Okay. Uh, that leads to things like technological advancement, which is important. Biology, uh, which is, you know, what we're going to be studying, what we're going to be investigating this year, uh, is just the study of living things and their interactions, okay? So a biologist uses the scientific method to study life, just like a chemist uses the scientific method to study chemistry, or a zoologist uses the scientific method to, to study animals, all right? There are many, many, many different fields, okay, and they overlap. Um, things you learn about, uh, you know, a chimpanzee may be useful as far as medication for a human being or, 
you know, the same is true of rabbits, right? A lot of times in immunotherapy, we study rabbits um, and apply those things we learn to human beings. So collaboration is really important. Collaboration is when you share things, okay? So um, some branches of biology, right? We have on the left, we have pure sciences. On the right, we have applied sciences. So uh, zoology, ecology, botany, paleontology, things you've probably heard of before, right? Uh, paleontology is like the study of old bones, uh, like dinosaurs and stuff. Cytology is the study of cells. Um, microbiology, micro means small. Virology, which is big right now because of COVID-19. And we're going to talk a lot about COVID-19 this year. Uh, but virology studies viruses. Um, a virologist would be a scientist in that field. Um, biochemistry is, you know, the study of the chemistry of life. Okay, genetics studies genes. Um, and then we have a lot of jobs that uh, take those sciences and utilize them, right? So a veterinarian definitely utilizes information from zoology. Uh, medical researchers, which, um, you know, they study things like the development of new medicines. They're probably studying botany, cytology, microbiology, sometimes virology, definitely biochemistry, definitely genetics. So these pure sciences on the left definitely go with the applied sciences on the right. They don't have to be doctors or whatever. You could also be a wildlife manager, a game warden, someone who works in agricultural research. Um, anything that deals with living things is going to, in some way, pull from the pure sciences of biology. And that list is not complete, right? There are many, many, many uh, pure science branches in biology. Now, since we're talking about living things, um, we definitely want to understand what makes something a living thing. And you must meet seven of these eight, the first seven uh, of these eight characteristics in order to be considered alive. So number one, you have to be composed of cells. Uh, we're spending a lot of time talking about cells and looking at cells this year. You've got to be able to reproduce. You don't necessarily have to reproduce, but you have to be able to. Um, you're, you need to be based on genetic code, so DNA, um, is important there. You've got to grow and develop. So, you know, you can't just stay stagnant. Uh, you need to obtain and use energy from your environment. So, you know, we eat lunch, right, in order to obtain uh, and use energy. Uh, we respond to our environment. So uh, reacting to stimuli or stimulus uh, is, is a characteristic of a living thing. Uh, and they have to be able to maintain homeostasis. Okay. And, and we'll talk a lot about what that word means very shortly. Now, number eight is a characteristic of living things. Living things do evolve, they change over time. However, you don't have to evolve to be considered alive, right? You are uh, completely allowed as a living thing to not evolve and go extinct. It happens all the time, okay? So number eight is uh, optional uh, as a characteristic of living things, but the first seven have to be met. Now, we're going to break these down into a little bit more detail. So um, when we say things are composed of cells, the cell is the smallest unit of life. That's really important that we know, okay? Uh, if something is smaller than a cell or it's not made of cells, we don't consider it to be a living thing. So like a virus is not a living thing. Uh, it is a particle um, that definitely interacts with living things, right? You can get a virus, but it's not living itself. Now, organisms can be uh, classified as either unicellular, having one cell, or multicellular, having two cells or more cells, okay? Uh, and cellular structure is really diverse. It's It's got a lot of different uh, components that go into it. So we'll talk about the organelles and the structure of the cells uh, throughout this year. The second characteristic is that living things reproduce. They don't just pop out of rocks, right? Um, you know, they don't uh, just, you know, poof, there's life, okay? Life comes from other living things. And there's two ways that this can occur. There's sexual reproduction, which is common in the animal kingdom. It requires two parents to donate genetic material. Uh, and then that genetic material is combined and, you know, you have a uh, fertilization event and you produce offspring. So uh, that's what human beings do. Cows, giraffes, you know, lizards, um, most, of, or most of the animal kingdom engages in sexual reproduction. There's also asexual reproduction. Now, whenever you see the letter A in front of a word, it means the opposite of. Okay, so asexual is the opposite of sexual. 
Um, it only requires one parent. And it basically, um, we, we see it a lot in the bacterial kingdom, but that's not the only place we see it. So this picture here on the right is a hydra. Uh, and you can see uh, on the right here, there's like this little bud growing out of it. It's literally called a bud. Uh, and it's cloning itself. And that bud will grow and then it'll just fall off and there'll be a clone of the parent. And that's a form of reproduction. Okay. Um, life is based on the genetic code. We'll spend some time uh, talking a lot about the genetic code and how it interacts with, or, or how the cell uses it, sorry, to make proteins. Um, DNA, it stands for deoxyribonucleic acid, uh, is what's going to determine in among other things, what you look like. Um, if you have an asexual reproduction event, the offspring will be a clone. So their uh, genes are identical to the parent, so they should look exactly the same. Uh, in sexual reproduction, it's not going to be identical. You have kind of a mixing of the two sets of genes, and we'll talk about that throughout the year. Now, when we say grow and develop, we're talking about some changes that occur, right? A, um, a newborn baby doesn't look like a grown adult, uh, just like frog eggs don't look like adult frogs. So over time, um, as the organism interacts with its environment, as it, you know, reacts to stimulus, it will change uh, and develop. So we look for living things to be dynamic, not static over time. They're going to obtain and use energy in order to grow and develop. you got to have some energy to drive that process forward, right? So uh, there's two kind of classifications that we use to define how things get their energy. There are heterotrophs. Hetero means different. Troph means to feed or to eat, um, really to feed. And that's, they acquire food from somewhere different. An autotroph, an auto means self, the prefix auto means self. Um, so autotrophs are uh, self feeders, they make their own food. So I'm a heterotroph. I like steak. I go out, and get my food, I eat. Uh, a tree is an autotroph, right? It uses uh, photosynthesis to make its own food. Metabolism, um, which is a word I'm sure you've all heard, is, uh, or is the series of reactions that an organism uses to break down those food molecules uh, in order to generate energy. We'll talk about metabolism this year. Now, we definitely know that living things respond to their environment. So a stimulus is a signal to which your body responds. That's an important word. The plural of stimulus is stimuli. There's two kinds. You can have an external stimulus, right, which is a stimulus that comes from the outside, or an internal stimulus, right, which is something you uh, generate yourself. So hunger is an internal stimulus. Uh, one of the things that can stimulate that is low blood sugar. You feel hungry, you go, oh, I need to respond to this. I go eat something, I feel better. If you have an external stimulus, it's like a loud noise. Um, you know, if uh, you know, you're know you laying in bed at night and you've got the windows open and the fan on and all of a sudden your door slams, right? Because there's, you know, airflow in the room. That, that definitely wake you up, right? You get a little jolt. So uh, an external stimulus is just something from the environment and you respond, right? You, you sit up in bed and you're like, hey, what was that? Um, one that maybe people don't think about, but that we can see over the long term is um, tree growth, right? So if you look at this picture right here, you'll notice that the, the leaves on the tree are all leaning towards the window. So the plant needs sunlight in order to, uh, to generate energy, right? And so the leaves tend to grow over there towards uh, the, the light in that picture, okay? And we can see that also, um, in forests and if you have bushes or anything like that, right? So that's that's something we can look for. Homeostasis is the next characteristic of living things. Uh, homeostasis is two word or two two parts kind of put together. Um, stasis means kind of staying the same. Homeo, which is similar to homo as a prefix, means the same. So we have hetero, which we talked about a minute ago, which means different. Homo or homeo means the same. So homeostasis is the process where your body keeps the internal conditions the same, even though the outside changes. So um, things that are really important about homeostasis, uh, sweating, right? If your body overheats, 
You can have heat exhaustion, heat stroke. You can actually die if you get too hot. So in order to keep your body at the same temperature, uh, you sweat when it gets hot. When you sweat, you know, your body produces uh, water or sweat that's on the surface of your skin and it absorbs heat from your, your muscles and evaporates and takes that heat with it. Okay. And that lowers your temperature of your body uh, and keeps you uh, internally about 98 degrees. If it's really cold outside, you could get hypothermia. Um, you could die from exposure, right? That would be bad. We'd like to avoid that. We need to keep the inside uh, warm enough to carry out all its chemical reactions. So if you get cold, you might shiver and your shivering causes your muscles to contract. And it's your muscles that actually generate a lot of your heat for the body. So lots of different ways we can maintain homeostasis. And again, uh, as we're going through these seven characteristics, you'll see these throughout the year. Um, we're just kind of giving an overview today. Now, the last one is uh, the optional, okay, kind of characteristic of living things. Um, evolution is change over time, and it's definitely a, a valid scientific observation um, that things do evolve, but you don't have to evolve to be alive. So in, in the context of um, the characteristics of living things, evolution is included there, but it's, it's optional. And the reason for that is individuals do not evolve themselves. Uh, it's the gene pool of a species that changes over time, that, which leads to overall changes in uh, your, your species. So we'll talk a lot about natural selection this year, uh, and we'll look at some of the theory of evolution and how that works. Okay, so those are the seven or, I guess, eight characteristics of living things. But remember, the first seven are the ones that have to be met in order for something to be alive. And you have to meet all seven, okay? Um, if you, uh, you know, no longer obtain and use energy. I got bad news for you, right? You're probably not going to make it. Um, if you uh, stop growing and developing, right? Yeah, it's probably not good for the, the outlook of, of a living thing. Okay, so we need to meet off set. Now, the last couple of slides, I just want to look at some general um, overarching concepts that we're going to see in biology. And the first is levels of organization. So from smaller to larger. Now, you'll notice there's a lot of blue and red on this slide. We'll spend all year to cover everything on this slide. We'll talk about molecules, cells, tissues, organs, and how things are organized. But just keep in mind that in biology, we're going to look at things from the small up to the large. So we'll look at cells, then we'll look at tissues, then we'll look at organs. So the way that might look in, in the body system, a heart cell um, makes up cardiac muscle, right? Cardiac muscle makes up the heart. The heart works with the lungs to make up the cardiovascular system. I, an organism, have a cardiovascular system, right? I'm an individual living thing. A bunch of human beings would be a population, okay? All the people in Rockbridge County is a population. Um, all of the people, the ants, the dogs, the cats, the other living things in Rockbridge County would be the community, Okay, if you throw in the rocks and the water and the bridges and, you know, the dead trees, um, that's our ecosystem, all right? And if we zoom out from Rockbridge County and look at the whole world, we call that the biosphere. And there is a relationship between the biosphere and the cells in our body, right? If the biosphere is polluted, then my cells may experience, um, you know, conditions that aren't favorable for them. So we'll look at the, the connections between all of those things, right? Now, scientific collaboration, we talked about a little bit earlier, and scientists study different areas of those um, levels of organization, right? Like if you study cytology, you look at cells. If you're a you know, physician, you might be looking at organisms um, or an organ system, right? You, you could just be a liver specialist. You're just looking at an organ, right? But they need to communicate with each other. And the way that they do that is through publishing research in scientific journals, okay? So uh, we want to make sure that the information that we are trusting from scientists are, um, are reputable, right? They've been peer-reviewed. Um, they've been looked at closely. And we'll talk about all those things throughout the week, okay? Now, some tools that you're going to see in here. we got three slides to go, so stay with me. I know this is a lot. 
Um, we're going to use light microscopes in here. Uh, I've got one that hooks to my computer that we'll be able to put some things up on the screen uh, when we get to that. It uses lenses and mirrors to, to use um, or to focus light on your slide and then it magnifies things with those lenses. We can study living cells or dead cells with that. Um, and the light microscope was the first microscope that we ever used to see cells. The electron microscope, I wish we had. Um, I have used one at Cornell University, but it's been a long time. Uh, it uses electrons instead of light in order to look at things. Um, it's got a much higher limit of resolution, which means it can, you know, see um, between very, very, very small things. Uh, but unfortunately, you can't look at living things with an electron microscope. They dry them out. They slice them real thin. They usually plate them with a heavy metal, uh, and they, they usually look at them in a vacuum. So uh, electron microscopes, we'll look at some of those pictures, uh, but we don't actually have those here. Now, that's the end of the slides. That's the 20 slides for the intro to biology. You should be able to answer these four things at this point. If you can't, go back in the video, go back in the slides, find the answers. Strongly recommend you write the answers down, right? So um, that's our first PowerPoint. If you have questions, let me know, uh, and I'll be glad to answer those, all right?